this morning. I'm in Luke, if you want to turn in your I'm in Luke chapter 19. I'm going to start reading at verse 28. Luke 19, verse 28. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road, and when he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles that they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest, Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, for now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize them, the time of God. You did not recognize the time of God coming to you. Can I ask a question? Is everybody warm enough? Can we knock one of the heaters off? Otherwise, I think everybody's going to be nodding off, I think. And I will have both of them off. I'm quite happy with that. Right. Now, I've got to warn you this morning. It may appear to some of you that I'm in a bit of a, I'm a, bit of a killjoy. I'm in a very serious mood. So let me explain why. Palm Sunday, which is what we're celebrating today, is normally a day when we sing joyful songs, and rightly so. We're celebrating Jesus, the King, being welcomed into Jerusalem. And we sing such songs as Ride on, ride on in majesty, make way, make way for Christ the King, and all glory, Lord, and honour, and so on. We've got our favourites for Palm Sunday. And it's good to celebrate. However, the danger is that we can skip so easily over the next Sunday, which is Easter Day, and we just go on with the celebration. And we can go on celebrating the joy of the resurrection. And in all of that celebration, there is a danger. The danger is this. We miss what happened in between those two Sabbath days. What a week that was. An awful lot happened during that week. It was probably the most epic week in human history. And in addition, it was one of the saddest weeks in human history. It contains the servant king washing his disciples' feet at the Last Supper. You can see the scene. Jesus sitting down and enjoying a last meal with his friends. And through it he brought it 
into being what you and I remember, the table of remembrance. Then we move on to the Garden of Gethsemane, with all of its pain, the depth of prayer, where we're told that his sweat looked like drops of blood. And that concluded with his commitment to God the Father when he said to him, may your will be done. Then we move from the peace of the garden to the betrayal by a kiss of one who had been with him for three years, one of the chosen twelve. And that's followed by the runaway of all the disciples, all of them deserting him. Then you've got the trial before the Jews. And after that, the trial before Pontius Pilate. Then he had to listen to the crowd who had been shouting hosannas, who now began shouting crucified. And then we move to the beating and the whipping, the humiliation and the walk down the Via della Rosa, followed by the agony of the lonely cross, and finally being laid in a cold, dark tomb. And that all happened in one week. You see, there is a danger for you and I, as Christians, that we can just be carried along with and by a crowd. And even in church, there's always the danger of just being carried along by the church. Oh, the joy of standing with others and singing praise to God for what he has done for us. Most of you know that I love to praise the Lord. Yet the danger is that we can just be swept along from one meeting to another meeting. You've got one speaker after another urging us on with one altar call after another. Church, if you had been in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, I tell you now, you would have been swept along with the crowd. It would have been very difficult not to have been caught up in the celebration because the mood was absolutely infectious. They had Jews from all over coming to Jerusalem for the celebration. The place was packed out. And you can see them all placing their robes before Jesus and waving their palm branches, shouting their praise. But church, even if we stop and we realize all that took place in that week, we may still miss something, something that is vital. I wonder if you have picked up what I want to talk about. It's the tears of Jesus. Jesus wept. You see the danger? That we can just concentrate on the singing and the praise, the literally the hosannas, and we can miss this. We can miss it. And I asked the question this morning, why did Jesus weep? Well, he certainly had good cause or reason to weep. He knew that what was coming, he knew that the cross with all, with all of its pain was before him. He knew that death itself was before him. He also knew the failure of his friends. That's reason enough, one might say, to weep. But that's only the human side. There's far more to the tears of Jesus. I believe that Jesus shed those tears, and when he shed them, he was revealing the heart of God the Father. A God 
who has such love that it's way beyond our comprehension. And at that time, I believe, Jesus the Son was literally touching the heart of the Father and he began to reveal the heart of God. Jesus was revealing the depth of God's compassion. A compassion that was willing to give and to give and to give for creation of this world. Jesus was revealing the heartache and the burden of God for the world. Also, a heartache due to God the Father being separated from his children by sin. And can you understand now why Jesus looked over Jerusalem and wept? His compassion for the lost was being revealed through his tears. He could do nothing. He was unable to do anything but pour out his love. We could quite easily just think of Palm Sunday as something that happened a long time ago. But I'm saying to you this morning, in truth, every day is Palm Sunday. Because Jesus still has got a compassion for the lost. Have a look out the window. See people going by, absolutely lost, no meaning, no purpose in their lives, going nowhere. No destiny at the end of their life. We are told that we must become like Jesus. And I asked the question this morning, and I'm having trouble here because my eyes are running. Why are our eyes dry? Why is there not a tear for the lost? How can we walk amongst them and not feel down at heart? Truly, church, and I love this church, don't take this as criticism because I'm involved in this as much as you. When did we as a fellowship get on our knees, weep before God for the lost? But the question must be asked, are we near enough to God to literally feel his heartbeat and know his desires? Because I think if we get to that place when we're touching the Father's heart, this place is going to be flooded with tears. Does the Holy Spirit commune and fellowship with your spirit? Are our spirits sensitive to his spirit that we are moved as one? Can I say that for every hour we spend in corporate praise and worship, we should spend at least two hours locked away seeking God's face and knowing his heart. Not just turning up on a Tuesday morning. This is in our own time. We should be seeking God. Seek him to touch his heart. Letting his will become ours. And our will become his. If truly our hearts were one with Jesus, then all our tears would mingle with his tears for the lost. What I know through the Spirit leading is that just one person's 
compassionate prayer can make a difference. Jesus can use it. God will use the prayer. A big part of a prayer meeting is in silent prayer. It should be people putting themselves right and moving closer to God and people also bringing the lost before the Lord. Church, over the years I have shared that we at Trinity have had a new revelation. It's been given to us as a fellowship. Let me share it a little bit deeper because we have some amongst us who have just joined us. Our vision is for this land and that we shall speak revival to the land. God gave us that a number of years ago. Ken will remember it. Let me say it again. Our vision is for this land and that we shall speak revival to the land. Let me explain what revival is. It starts in the church, not the world. It actually starts with you and me. The work of the Holy Spirit is vital to revitalize the local church. And the entire process of revitalization is based on prayer. Seeking spiritual health and asking for the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, without the presence of the Holy Spirit at work in the life and the ministry of the local church, everything is in vain. The church may experience numerical gains in attendance, But without the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the church will not experience redemption. It won't experience kingdom of God growth. It will just be like a social or a world. The work of the Holy Spirit in revitalization can be compared to the human body. A person can live and breathe without arms and legs. Yes? A local church is an organism which is a part of the body of Christ. A local congregation can love the Lord without making any impact on the kingdom. Church growth New Testament principles gives the church arms and legs. It gives it purpose, it gives it direction to make a significant impact for the kingdom of God. And without the blessing and the energy of the Holy Spirit, a local church is just a secular organisation which may experience society growth. How many of you know that spiritual renewal begins with a vision from God? And you will get your vision when you take time out to fast and pray and wait on God. Nehemiah is an example of a leader who was filled with passion and empowered by the Holy Spirit to bring about a renewal of leaders in Jerusalem. Let me read one verse from Nehemiah 1. Before Nehemiah travelled to Jerusalem, he sat down and wept. For some days he mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. We don't know exactly how long he fasted, but it wasn't just for a couple of days. It could have been a month or more that he fasted and he wept. If we are truly to speak in faith, in faith, 
to get God to move and pour out his spirit on this land, then there's got to be a change, church. We've got to have a change of heart. We cannot just pray the words. We, and by we, I mean all our feelings and our emotions have got to be released in our prayers. We've got to get beyond flesh and soul. We've got to get into spirit. Distant prayers do very little. And I'm not talking about speaking of mileage there. I'm speaking of the distance between our spirit and the Holy Spirit. We have to be in complete unity. To put it simply, our prayers have got to be wet with tears for the lost. I tell you the day is coming when sorrow and grief for our state and for the lost will overwhelm us in our prayer meetings. I can feel it in, in the, on a Tuesday morning there is such a depth of love building on a Tuesday morning. And I'm sorry some of you can't be with us because of work, but take my word for it. On a Tuesday morning there's been a change. There's a unity and a love on a Tuesday morning that is growing and God is going to use it. God is going to use it and one of these days, we're going to have a church that just breaks out and weeps. We'll be weeping for the lost. Nobody asks you to do it or make you do it. It will just come through the Spirit. If you need to start, can I suggest that you get on your knees and weep for those of your family who don't know the Lord? or who have become prodigals, that's a good place to start. Let us pray. Let us by prayer move to that place where we feel and know the beat of the Saviour's heart that his compassion and our compassion will join together into a tremendous flood that will move over this land. Church, listen to the words of Jesus from Luke 19. You did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Can I remind you, Trinity, that we are in that period of time when God is continually coming to us through his Son, Jesus Christ. The Good Shepherd is still looking for the lost. But church, the day will come when he returns and then it will be too late to repent. It will be too late then to acknowledge him as Saviour and Lord. You will be taken in the state that you are. And not one of us, and I've heard so many people trying to expound and make idiots of themselves when it didn't happen. Not one of us knows the time of that day. It may be today, maybe tomorrow. So answer the call of the Lord upon your life. You see, you and I live in a culture where we really want to be free of every burden. And I want to say to you this morning, if you're a Christian, then we've got to have a burden for others. You can't remain isolated from the needs of others. <coughs> Let me end by giving you, and we're finishing early this morning, so don't worry over it. Can I give you an illustration that demonstrates the difference of having a burden for others. Shortly after coming to Christ, Sadhu Sundar, who was a Hindu convert to Christ, felt called to become a missionary to India. 
And late one afternoon, Sadhu was traveling on foot through the Himalayas with a Buddhist monk. It was bitterly cold and the wind felt like sharp blades slicing into Sadhu's skin. Night was approaching fast when the monk warned Sadhu that they were in danger of freezing to death if they did not reach the monastery before dark. And just as they were traversing a narrow path around a steep cliff, they heard a cry for help. And down the cliff lay a man fallen and badly hurt. The monk looked at Sadhu and said, Don't stop. God has brought this man his faith. He's got to work it out for himself. Then he quickly added while walking on, let's hurry on before we too perish. But Sadhu replied, God has sent me here to help my brother. I cannot abandon him. And the monk continued trudging off through the whirling snow while the missionary clambered down that steep embankment. The man's leg was broken and he couldn't walk. So Sadhu took his blanket, made a sling of it and tied the man on his back. Then bending under his burden, he began a body torturing climb. And by the time he reached the narrow path again, he was drenched in perspiration. Doggedly, he made his way through the deepening snow and the darkness. And it was all he could do to follow the path. But he persevered, though he was faint with fatigue and he was overheated with exertion. Finally, he saw ahead of him the lights of the monastery. And then for the first time, Sadhu stumbled and nearly fell. But it wasn't from weakness. He'd stumbled over an object lying in the snow-covered road. And slowly he bent down on one knee and brushed the snow off the object. It was the body of the monk, frozen to death. Years later, a disciple of Sadhu asked him, what is life's most difficult task? And without hesitation, Sadhu replied, to have no burden to carry. My friends, if you are not burdened for the loss of the day, you really need to examine yourself. Take time to ask God to soften your heart, to make room for the burden of another. You know I keep on about unity. I'm always on about unity. God has laid it upon me. Without unity, nothing. God looks for oneness. But he's not just looking for oneness in the church. God's looking for us to be one with them. Just because we're Christian doesn't make us any better than them. We're just blessed that we have a the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we are saved. But it doesn't make us any better than that. They're just uninformed. You and I have got to develop a heart for the lost. It's got to be our cry. You've got to keep crying out to God for the lost. So I know it's Palm Sunday. And I know you all came here to dance and to rejoice. But I'm asking you, this week is Passion Week. And tonight I'll be talking on Passion. You won't like that very much, I can tell you that now. But it's all very well to praise the Lord and for you. Yes, we can rejoice because we're saved. We know the Lord and we know where we're going. We can rejoice. The church, take a moment. Think of those in your family. Think of your friends and those around you who are not saved. Bend the knee in prayer and weep a little for those who are lost. Amen? Amen. Yes. Can I share a story? Yes. By all means.
Coming out and I'll give you a microphone. But being a good boy, I'll give you a microphone. Back last year, we had a men's breakfast at St. Julius Baptist Church. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the speaker was John... Gosh, my... The carpenter from Emmanuel. John Hammond. John Hammond. No, Hammond. Yeah. Anyhow, John was speaking. And all of a sudden he stopped. And he says, someone here this morning needs to know the Lord. And we were, hmm? And he carried on speaking for a while. And he said, I'm sorry about this, he said, but this won't go away. He says, someone here this morning needs to know the Lord. And he started speaking again. And he carried on for about four or five minutes. And he said, I'm sorry. He said, I'm really sorry about this. He said, but someone here this morning needs to know the Lord. Two brothers were at this meeting. One was a Christian and one wasn't. And again he stopped and he said, someone here this morning desperately knows, needs to know the Lord. And before you go, he said, speak to someone. And John finished speaking. And the two, everybody went their own ways. The one brother, who wasn't a Christian, rang his brother and said, I need to know Jesus. Will you help me? Yes, he said, certainly. So he went to his brother's house and he spoke to him and he led him to the Lord. That was on the Saturday morning. He went to bed Sunday night and he never woke up. Today is the day of salvation. You're not promised tomorrow. You're not promised the next hour. If you need to know the Lord, you need to know him now. Amen. Thank you, Martin. Sorry, That's all right. Don't be sorry. Praise the Lord. Thank you, group.